so glad to have you on this morning and, and chatting with us in the community. Um, for I'm sure everyone knows who you are, but let's just start with uh, your name and title at CNI. Sure. I'm Gene Hoffman. I'm the CEO and president of GNA Network Inc. All right. So um, a lot of us know a bit about your background, but some people might not. So I wanted to start with before you ever gotten involved with Chia, uh, what are some highlights of your, your background in the tech world? Well, I'll try to do the quick uh, CV, if you will. So uh, I, I co-invented internet ad blocking and cookie cutting in the 90s and sold that company to PGP Inc., uh, PGP Inc. is the Canada granddaddy crypto company. Um, famously, Phil Zimmerman was investigated by the Department of Justice for exporting strong cryptography, which was then a felony like exporting a nuclear weapon. Uh, once DOJ decided not to prosecute, he started a company and we tried to license some software and they turned the tables and bought us. And so uh, while there, I was the second person to export PGP. Uh, we decided to put print it in a uh, book and actually send it out of, out of the country to go ahead and get our international subsidiaries to actually... Um, be able to compile and use PGP. And then uh, when PGP was being sold to McAfee, I was deciding whether I was to start an anonymous digital cash company then or what became emusic.com. Uh, my now wife, then girlfriend looked at me and went, strange Caribbean island surrounded by armed guards. You should do that music thing. So uh, <laughs> emusic helped launch the iPod. Uh, the internal design was mine. The external design was Johnny Ives. Uh, Tony Fidel worked for me for a little while at emusic. Uh, and then when Universal bought eMusic, uh, we introduced the Universal guys, the Apple guys, and that was the Apple iTunes music store, uh, as you know it. So uh, with that, spent another year or so uh, with the, with the Universal, and then built a subscription backend infrastructure company with what we'd learned at eMusic selling MP3s. And spent about uh, 12, 13 years of that, and sold that to Amdocs in 2016. Uh, and, you know, I'd been running the Cypherpunks meetings. Uh, Bram and I had like eight or 10 friends in common. Uh, but uh, we didn't actually meet until like 2010 because we were in the same uh, venture portfolio when he was running BitTorrent and I was at uh, my previous company. But when I heard he had a solution to the proof of work energy problem, I'm like, we got to talk. Uh, and I was either the first or the second meeting that the then co-founders took. The other guy was Naval. So good, you know, company to be in. And so, you know, been with Chia from the inception. Uh, originally, I was supposed to be our audit committee chair. We had the public company strategy at all, you know, since inception. But uh, about six years ago now uh ended up going full-time and you know took over officially as ceo about a year and change ago but was effectively r running it with bram for quite a while wow okay so you answered one of my other questions i was going to ask and that's how did you meet bram so it sounds like you were part of uh were they online communities or or what well, like, so Lynn Saspen was kind of like an outside developer at PGP when I was running engineering at PGP, uh, and Lynn lived with uh, Bram for quite a while. Um, you know, a couple other folks that I can think of off the top that just, you know, know both of us. But uh, so we knew of each other, and we were both at a uh, Doll Capital Christmas party when we actually first met. And, you know, we, again, had so much context, it was just kind of immediately uh, thick as thieves. That's great. So for people that are unfamiliar with PGP, th this is a uh, cryptography uh, that was getting going in what, the 90s? Yeah, so it was really you know early 90s, and it was the first time that really strong cryptography was available, effectively open source or nearly free for use on the then kind of burgeoning internet, right? Uh, before that, you either were buying or licensing you know really expensive stuff from RSA or other folks, or uh, it was you know, DOD stuff that you couldn't get your hands on. So it really was kind of the first time that mere mortals could have truly strong cryptography. And I had watched one of your other interviews where you, you talked about the PGP and how you put it in a book. And that was one of the, the legal loopholes. And uh, one thing I was impressed with is in your, your talks, it seems like you do have a very good grasp on a lot of the legal issues that arise in technology specifically. where When did that start? When did your interest in, in delving into law begin? It actually started when uh, we were trying to license some software to Excite at home. Or no, it was, probably it was InfoSeq actually to go way back. Uh, and we'd had a long kind of negotiation and thought we were getting to a deal when all of a sudden our software appeared on their website. And so that was the first time uh, I interacted with the federal courts because obviously we sued them for copyright infringement because we found like literal strings that were jokes in our in the software we were downloading it was like okay not only did you rip it off you ripped it off line by line 
And that kind of started it. But then the second part was really sitting there with the problem of, okay, PGP Inc. is running and we need to start selling to everybody because, I mean, one of the major uses of PGU back in the day was for cross-border communications. Um, I think I could tell the story now. Uh, Boeing actually uh, lost the 757's engines to the French reading their email while they were negotiating with uh, EAD. And so Boeing was an early big customer, but of course, you know, you needed to be able to take PGP out of the United States to use PGP outside of the United States to communicate back to the United States. So um, Bob Cohn uh, was the general counsel of Borland and kind of storied uh, software lawyer himself. And in fact, uh, he won, which is a hard way to win, 4-4 of the Supreme Court that copyright's not patent in Borland v. Lotus. Uh, And so, you know, certainly mentored with him a bit about, you know, all of his exploits. You know, he obviously had a little bit to do with Microsoft getting an antitrust case. So, you know, got an early view. And then, you know, when I'd kind of come up with about the same time he and Roz Thompson did the the book idea, um, you know, that was kind of the beginning of realizing that the legal system was a tool one could really <laughs> use if you really understood both the law and the politics of the law, if you will. Uh, and that became really important when I moved on to eMusic. Uh, the recording, yeah, recording Industry Association tried to stop the Diamond Rio before it even shipped. And I had like the second Diamond Rio that existed in the U.S. And so uh, Bob and I actually were amici in that case and, you know, knew more about it than, you know, Diamond's outside counsel. And so we're able to kind of make what ultimately became the Grokster argument uh, in front of the Ninth Circuit and then the lower court as well. And so, you know we kept mp3 players from being nipped in the bud effectively so you know it really reiterated that there was no way to be disruptive in technology without understanding the impact of the bill of rights uh, how the first amendment the fourth amendment the fifth amendment really matter to software and and you know we saw this again right so as as pgp was ending export controls we had folks ending the clipper chip which was kind of the u.s government's backdoored solution to crypto and uh you know, Matt, uh, I don't want to forget Matt's last name, you know, Blaze, right? Uh, he proved that it was a complete untrustworthy piece of crap. Um, <laughs> but that story keeps repeating. You know, we saw F- FBI try to force Apple to rewrite how true end-to-end encryption works on iOS. And the answer was no. And that's kind of the beauty of being in America is that software developers get to say, no, this is my creative speech. And sorry, we're not changing it because it might suit your policy preferences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow all right so a lot of uh tech adventures before you got to chia and you said chia then arose sometime in 2010 ish when you met bram for the first time no i that was just bram and i getting to know each other personally uh you know we pgp pardon me chia was a 2016 late kind of 2017 project um you know bram had been a skeptic of blockchains um i think i was probably more a fan than he was uh, but some other of his friends kind of came to him and said, no, there's a th- real thing here. You should look closer. And he did. Um, and then that kind of led to, for example, the uh, Bitcoin uh, meetup that's very famous now where it was actually Christoph was in the audience and he was talking about, Bram was talking about proof of space and, and time. And Christoph looked at him and went, yeah, I know exactly what you're thinking about and it's totally busted. And so that actually started the development of proof of space. And it was really until Bram came up with a proof of space primitive that uh, he and a couple other folks couldn't beat that the, you know, real drive to build Gia Network and go forward was. And that was kind of mid-17. Okay. Wow. So Bram was was thinking of a way to improve upon Bitcoin, so to speak, uh, less energy. Yeah. It was, you know, proof of work solved. Well, I'll back up. There's a marketing myth running around that proof of stake is a modern thing. Proof of stake, all the technologies existed before proof of work. And so proof of work was invented to fix the problems with proof of stake. But it's a kind of horrible, beautiful, evil solution to the problem, which is basically like assume the worst and make that the default way that things work. So the idea was to say, hey, wait, what if we could um, delay the work? What if we could do a little work and that's still provable and you still get all the Sybil resistance and all that sort of stuff, but you're not just grinding the entire time? And so that's where both kind of proof of space and proof of time came out of Bram's mind was, you know, how do we create effectively proof of proof of work? And so, you know, I often describe proof of space and time as being proof of proof of work. Wow. So before Chia was even conceived in in Bram's mind with this proof of space and time, 
you already were um, in the, the crypto world, you were interested in it. And what were the chains that you were initially working uh, or looking at? Well, my view very early on was Bitcoin was the only real deal, but we didn't have any smart contracting. And it was clear to me that it was going to take forever for that to happen. Uh, and, you know, I like the promises Ethereum made, but it was also very clear to me that it was designed to be easy to um, go viral and not designed for what is the world's most uh, antagonistic compute environment ever known to man. And so from that perspective, you know, part of why Chia made so much sense when I heard Bram was up to something was when I looked at the space, I went, Bitcoin looks like a kind of painful COBOL like thing, ultimately, you know, and it's right, it's good, but it's not moving forward like we really need to, to be able to be, you know, the financial rails that everybody uses in the background, because, you know, there's this long old debate inside the cypherpunks which is kind of the american revolution versus the french revolution and a lot of the cypherpunks are very much french revolutionaries it was you know viva la resistance everything has to be perfectly you know to the revolution versus the american revolution was like well we still need government but taxes were bad so let's figure out a way to make sure we don't get back to that same mess but let's be pragmatic about making sure these systems will actually work and you know, that debate has long led to things like uh, this debate actually started with uh, Adam Back and I and John Callis getting into a fight about whether like Boeing could make it so that PGP email would also encrypt to their chief security officer. So if somebody died or somebody was fired, they could actually decrypt their emails. And the, the French Revolution view was, my God, you're building back doors for government. And the, you know, American Revolution view was, well, if we don't make this stuff usable by mere morals, it won't be used in the first place and we'll get none of the value. So that continues today. Um, you know, we see that out there with both Bitcoin, with parts of Ethereum. You know, the reality for our, from my perspective is, and I think Bram agrees, is that we want to make these technologies be just so common and so used that their default assumptions are there. And, you know, not all of those services that are run on, say, the GIA blockchain will be permissionless. That's fine. But ultimately, the core capabilities are totally permissionless. And, you know, cash isn't a bad idea. <laughs> all right. So tell us a little bit about what it was like in the early days in starting up this company, GIA Network. It was wild to be the dumbest man in the room. Um, you know, we had just incredible group of people when we were really kind of originally doing the R&D here. Uh, there was a funny joke for a little while. Basically, everybody in the room was either a PhD, PhD candidate, or a dropout. There was nothing in between for quite a while. Uh, you know, I, I'm happy that I could kind of keep up with the math, but not totally. Like, you know, if you ask me to, to go too deep on proof of space, uh, I think Celeste Timler put it well, it's beyond Hoffman. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, that was that was amazing like you know playing with vdf where we had just written it and just proven it worked you know these were like new math sitting there on your laptop for the first time ever and you know validating a proof of time and being one of the first like 10 people in the world to validate a proof of time pretty wild stuff um you know it it certainly became more of a software company kind of once we finally hit the alpha stage and it was like okay all the bits are built how do we put it all together and actually make a blockchain but, you know, that first in, interim period is a kind of unique thing just because it was so theoretical mathematics and uh, theoretical and product design. It was really thinking about, you know, okay, Ethereum's not getting traction because of all these major issues around custody and solidity and other things. You know, what are these use cases? And are we making sure that, for example, the design of GeoLisp, because originally we thought it was going to be GeoScript, uh, is right? Does it, you know, prove out for all the use cases we really want? And so, you know, things like bringing in Olajo, uh, Olajo, I always get his name bad, from Lightning to make sure that, like, you know, the stuff they'd love to do in Lightning could easily be implemented in GeoLisp. And then also really uh, interfacing with banks and governments and talking to them about what their requirements were and, you know, if we were on the right track with the kind of capabilities that we thought would be kind of most relevant when we shipped to the Geo blockchain. Wow. So you were getting input along the way during the, the development process from big entities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the nice part about both Bitcoin and Ethereum is you had a roadmap for what was possible. Um, 
And from there, it was, okay, let's start thinking about why you might have these entities not moving forward. And, you know, it was things like sovereign wealth funds, uh, banks that were talking about, you know, how they would use it. And, you know, from that perspective, it was important because it also let us then kind of go that next level down and test our assumptions about Geolisp and about what we're building initially. You know, that's partially why, excuse me, offers was kind of a high priority thing early on. It was that kind of atomic swap peer-to-peer -peer capability that we thought was going to be critical. You know, it's also why custody has always been something we've talked about. Uh, you know, having personally messed with Bitcoin and Ethereum before all of this, you know, the custody solutions are scary. And I'm a very fluent cryptographer and security guy, right? Well, I wouldn't say I'm a cryptographer. I'm a cryptographer uh, developer. I think that's the better way I'd put it. But my point being, you know, it was just not something like I was going to get my wife to comfortable use. And she's relatively sophisticated. You know, we we knew we had to build primitives and capabilities that would let us build later those things that would make it so that, you know, normal people could absolutely self-custody tens of thousands to millions to billions of dollars. All right. Wow. Okay. So um, we saw the, the tremendous growth of Chia happen and um, you had a, quite a few employees uh, all working on this at the peak. How many people were working for Chia? We had about 70 at the peak, maybe 75. Right. So, but we're, we're back up to about 50 again. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a kind of weird number. And the reason why I say it's a weird number is like Yak's not an employee, but we probably will grant him something. And so like he once in a while shows up and, you know, the, the, the line between being employed and not employed is obviously bright in one sense, but not so bright in another, because, you know, a lot of folks didn't remain formally with the company, but are still in the community doing, you know, what they do. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, it, it's an interesting thing on the flip side. We like it because, you know, a lot of our development team came up through the ranks of the community. You know, yeah. it, it, it was, you know, we thought Jack Nelson was a college kid. Turned out he was a high school kid, you know, and well, yeah, he's great. And so now he continues to develop for Chia, right? Like these are, these are kind of a, a fun thing when you think about the long view, you know, being able to have a development resource so that was always, you know, real professional attention to the kind of core blocking and tackling while creating a platform for everybody else to go create stuff on. I think it's just, you know, a much more superior way to put all this stuff together. Yeah. So you name dropped uh, Yak. He's the one that's developing the bridge to Ethereum, right? Mm hmm. Okay. Yep. He's also got Tibet Swap and, uh, okay. I can't remember the name of his academy, but he also got some, you know, cloud tools and some, you know, developer learning kit. Okay. And then this is a good segue then to uh, Dr. Nick. He uh, also was a third party out there developing his own plotter. And CNI just announced the acquisition of his IP and, and now an employee of CNI. That's right. So, uh, yeah. Do you want to talk any about uh, the hiring of Nick and, and what you see ahead for, with that? Well, so, you know, I will say one thing in, you know, this is one of the things I was talking about being in pure R&D mode. We didn't have a lot of GPU experience on the team. It was very much, you know, we had like people who built ASICs before. We had, you know, high-end compute. You know, I was kind of at least our scaled compute uh, expert. And, you know, a lot of the kind of parameter decisions kind of fell to myself making recommendations to Bram and us validating it and going with it. Dr. Nick clearly has that expertise on the GPU compute side, even above and beyond what Harold has. And so it was a very kind of key thing when Dr. Plotter popped up, we were like, oh, that is interesting. And in fact, it somewhat was the driver of uh, the the need to, to make a hard fork. You know, it was basically like, oh, okay, that is much further than we thought that would get. But the good news is it turns out that there's some relatively trivial, I don't want to over trivialize it, relatively trivial constant changes we can make it can make it much harder for the GPU to be that much faster while still being able to plot relatively quickly um, and not necessarily sacrificing people being able to CPU plot even, you know, certainly better than at first, let's say it that way. Uh, so, you know, from that perspective, being able to, uh, to find that expert, have that expert having kind of come up through the community and proven the jobs and then be able to, you know, put them in a great spot compensation wise, where if this continues to scale and work, they do quite well and they got compensated for what they did do. And, you know, obviously the hard fork kind of ends the future of a lot of these kind of compression techniques. We didn't want him to feel uh, you know, like he left out on some uh, compensation out there. So, so, you know, we're excited. It's great to have these kinds of experts and, 
you know, when people think about what's going on about a proposed hard fork, you know, it's a conversation between Bram, Dr. Nick, uh, Max, uh, but also uh, Christoph and others where, you know, there's a lot of deep mathematical expertise that goes into, you know, all of this. And when you add somebody like Dr. Nick to a team like that, you get just a whole nother perspective that can quickly validate because, you know, once everybody else sees how that works, then it gets more creativity in the room. It's, it's just kind of an amazing process, but it is a process even I don't, you know, involve myself with, I get reports out of it because I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to see him on the team. And um, I've, as you know, I'm using his product. It's, it's quite polished already. So I'm excited to see what he uh, helps contribute to the new platform. Um, all right. So what, what is it that you enjoy working on the most within CNI? You, you wear a lot of hats, but uh, what do you enjoy doing the most? Well, it's two things. I mean, I, you know, my long-term job here is to be an evangelist for Chia and, you know, it's to go out and be the face of the, at least the business side of Chia uh, but I think, you know, I, product still is a, a love of mine. You know, we're out here in a world where, well, I'll say it a different way. It scares me that other projects haven't tackled some of the major things we're tackling around custody, around atomic swaps. Um, you know, offers and vaults are going to just be this huge unlock to how real businesses can actually use blockchains for real business. And the process of, you know, really thinking through how to make equity at issuance work perfectly and well and, you know, garner the the value that you get on a blockchain. You know, one of the secret weapons that blockchains have are things like secure the bag. And the, the marriage of the technical sophistication to know what's capable and the business knowledge to know why that'd be valuable. You know, that to me is very exciting right now. I, I get to kind of sit in the middle of all of that and really drive both the product itself to be, you know, more easy to use, more secure, and by the way, more easy to use by normal people. Um, you know, one of the things you'll kind of hear me fight about a lot with folks in Bitcoin and others are people like, oh, but, you know, 24 words are just fine. And it's like, you clearly don't have a girlfriend. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, like you're not really thinking about normal people trying to use this because, you know, if it's not at least as easy as what you already have, why would you move, right? And and I think, in fact, what it can be, and I've said this before, is that it can be easier to use than cash and harder to steal. And that's something we haven't had before. So it's always exciting when you're really thinking about how to put together use that hasn't been seen before. Like, you know, you're not seeing nation states trade with each other trustlessly, escarillous, peer-to-peer. Well, that's something that Shia blockchain just does. And turning that into user interface and experience, I think that's the thing that really, you know, I get up in the morning for. Awesome. So um, turning the page here, what are some other projects that have inspired you and sparked ideas that she might want to emulate or improve upon? Well, obviously we keep up with lightning you know, research very closely. Um, you know, we think that part of the problem is that people look at lightning today on Bitcoin and think this kind of sucks. And yes, it does with Bitcoin script. That's where it is. If Bitcoin script were Bitcoin Lisp, then you'd have like a version three of lightning that works so much better than what's currently available. That's relatively easy to implement on Chia. And obviously Bram's gaming work is going to bring us a lot closer. It's not the whole way there, but it is a, a large, heavy lift of payment channel because it's, you know, gaming state channel basically. So, you know, obviously we'll look at that. Um, you know, we're always interested in what Zcash and Monero guys do. Those are very real projects. Um, you know, beyond that, I think we more look at the academic research. So, you know, we're looking at things like Verkle trees and, um, you know, advancements to the VDF. You know, we keep, a, would say, a lesser eye, but an eye out for post-quantum uh, cryptography that would make sense in certain pieces. You know, our VDF probably isn't post-quantum, but there's some moon math that is that would work, but now it's too slow. You know, that's where you want to see it because in five years that gets faster. So, you know, those are kind of the things that I'd say we keep most of our eye on. You know, unfortunately, there's not a lot of projects that are leading and solving what I think are the real problems about getting blockchains used. You know, there's not a lot of people thinking hard about how to make 
custody kind of tiered. You know, there's a difference between your checkbook and your investment account. You know, your checkbook, you're going to spend it all day, every day. Your investment account, you shouldn't be moving it maybe once a month. Um, you know, CASA is one of the things we see that does some stuff there that we, you know, we think that's interesting. You know, Jameson and his company is interesting. Obviously, you know, we pay attention to the securitized guys because we think they're the most serious at helping bring equities beyond ourselves out there. Uh, so that's kind of the the landscape we look at. Again, you know, we see just a whole lot of the casino running the casino and we don't see the casino having the the needs of like, well, but you got to audit that. And, you know, these are just like base case things where, you know, if you just run any any business beyond the smallest business ever, you know that you need more than one signer to spend above a certain level. Like that's just, it's kind of like breathing. And, you know, the reality is very little of the crypto infrastructure even thinks like that. So, you know, I, I hope that kind of answers your question, but it means that we look at some, some, some different things than I think people would otherwise think we might. Okay. So these other projects that you just mentioned, um, Chia would be... Uh, scaling on the L2 for these types of things, right? For the privacy aspect, if it were to go that way. Yeah. So, you know, we intentionally added ZK operators from BLS to the kind of core CLS CLVM. And that's because we believe that you can do really interesting ZK rollups where, you know, effectively the privacy is like cash. So, you know, you'd still be well known going into the ZK rollup and coming out just like, you know, when you go to your ATM, your bank knows it's you. But what goes on during your actual transacting is relatively hard for a third party to either see or reconstruct. So, you know, we, we think that's where a lot of the privacy is going to be. And, you know, the current state of this debate, the crypto space is pretty silly, actually. The reality is, is that, you know, when you're talking about Fidelity or JP Morgan Chase or Boeing, those folks want certain levels of privacy. Like they're fine that they know, you know, that they have a supplier. They do not want you to be able to see how much of the supplies they bought at what price they bought it at. You know, so those are going to be very real drivers of just, you know, normal privacy that people have to have. But, you know, we do think that layer one should be a highly auditable thing. You know, we want it to be that when you're, you know, tracing a transaction to know, you know, did this withdrawal from a ZK rollup really happen that mathematically, you know, you know, you don't know how it got between it got in and it got out but you are very comfortable that no coin was created or destroyed. All right. Well, that kind of touches on one of the questions that I was going to have for you today as well. And what, what are your thoughts about the current state of U.S. government regulations in the crypto space? For example, know your customer laws, how the SEC is treating things, et cetera. So there's a situation going on here where some of the federal government has had to deal with the fact that they can't regulate software. And so the places that have seen that is the State Department, the Commerce Department, the FBI. But folks like the CFTC and the SEC have never dealt with this issue. They have always thought, hey, you know, we kind of have a speech exemption, you know, we'll, we'll live with it. Now, the reality is, is that the Supreme Court has gotten consistently far more speech protective, even commercial speech. You know, recently, I guess about a decade ago now, but, you know, Vermont and some other states tried to make it so that... Uh, prescription data couldn't be sold to data brokers to basically compensate pharma salespeople. And the Supreme Court went, this is a speech restriction and it's subject to scrutiny. We don't care. It's commercial speech. You know, speech is speech. So I, so there's a bit of that classic, you know, when there's a disruption, certain people who are going to be disrupted and look, there's certain parts of the SEC that will become less important when you don't need to trust an exchange or a broker to be able to do a, you know, securities transaction. So, you know, you can imagine that both desire to keep your job and desire to keep your power, you want to push back on that. And we're seeing some of that. Now, the reality is, is that we're seeing them overstep. Um, and so things like the U.S. tornado cash prosecution, I don't expect to go well for the government because the issue is going to be that, you know, you're already seeing folks like Ron Wyden wade in because, you know, there's there's the community that supports crypto as free speech because they like crypto. But then there's the community that supports software as free speech because they like software. And every time you get a step past that, and you saw this with the FinCEN regulations where, again, Wyden and others stepped in and went, DOJ, what the hell are you saying? You know, you're telling, trying to say a software developer that has no custody is somehow a money transmitter? You know, I, I think you'll start to see the impact and the bite of the First Amendment. Now, it's a little annoying that you've got federal government 
representatives, frankly, pushing relatively crazy views. And, you know, I, I don't want to like let everybody off. There are certain parts of DOJ and certain parts of the SEC that are just insane. Um, now, you know, I'll also say, however, that there's a lot of the SEC that's not. And so it's important to remember that these aren't monolithic things, right? You know, you can literally have a rogue, you know, AUSA make a, a statement that may take a while for main justice to decide is a bad idea. And, you know, I think we've got some of that stuff going on out there. Also, you know, some of the most, what I would call extreme SEC views have not been well received by federal judges. You know, the idea that the Coinbase non-custodial wallet was a broker dealer was just shot down on a motion to dismiss. For those of you who know the law, that means it was a really bad argument. Uh, you know, because usually the government survives something like that. So so a lot of the worst ideas are correctly being laughed at by the courts. It's going to take time for that to happen. And, you know, it's really unfortunate that somebody at the Department of Justice thinks you can make a software developer criminal liable just for writing software. That's like, you know... Those are the 1984 cases that I wish you could tar and feather about. All right. Yeah, I was very interested when uh, I was watching some of the uh, proposed tax laws come down for you, the U.S. and as it pertains to crypto, like the uh, $10,000 or more transaction. Um, it looks like the government was getting more and more involved and in, in, uh, trying to get their hands in the space. Well, so right this second, there's kind of a weird scenario going on. The, the, you know, the White House is basically given all fintech regulation outsourced to Warren. And Warren's got a very strange view of state power that, by the way, most of the rest of the Democratic Party doesn't agree with. And so, you know, there is this everything must be KYC, everything must be reported, what Fourth Amendment thing going on. And it's a problem. But the issue is, is that the technology doesn't give a crap. Because, you know, the whole point I'm making is, is that with things like offers, there's no reason equity securities need an exchange. And like a great example of this conversation is the Exchange Act is about a noun. An exchange is a noun. It is a place. It is, you know, at worst, a virtual place. It is not a verb. And when you like do an offer for a security, that's a verb. It's an action. It isn't a place. And so, you know, you've got like I mean, I don't necessarily agree with all the hex views, but, you know, Richard Hart's right to say you can't sue a blockchain. It's a software. It's a sidewalk. You know, you can't sue a sidewalk. The federal courts don't have jurisdiction over inanimate objects unless it's seizure. <laughs> right. So, you know, so we're in this weird place where everybody's decided that, you know, we must stop terrorism. We must stop whatever bad thing, except for all of it's actually done in cash today over swift and fedwire or boxes of money so the reality is, is there's a very strong pushback from congress once you start getting to the end of cash and it's the it, you see this with the cbdc pushback right because they're right there are bad cbdc's and none of us would want those now you can have a good cbdc you know you can have a cbdc that is privacy protecting that does run in a zk roll up that does work just like the good old fashioned american dollar bill except it's easier to custody, it's harder to steal, you know, all the things you want. So, you know, I, I think we're seeing, you know, those fights get engaged with. I do not think the government's going to win all those fights. In fact, I think they win less of them than they expect. Again, because we've seen the Supreme Court continue to be much more rights protecting than most people expect, you know, and a lot of this stuff is being done ultra vires. Um, you know, it's not Congress passing a law that says you get to do this. It's, you know, the, the regulatory agencies thinking they have the power to extend their reach. And I think that's going to continue to also be something that gets smacked down quite a bit. So, you know, ultimately I have a lot of confidence, but I do think it's going to be a fight. I mean, this is the, the next big crypto war is that no, we have financial privacy and no, you know, you cannot force third parties to report on me so you can get around the fourth amendment. Very good. All right. So we all know that um, CNI hopes to IPO soon. <laughs> and uh, when that day comes, hopefully soon, uh, what do you expect might change? How, how will the functioning of CNI change? What will the community see change? In so, you know, I hope that that's going to be 
relatively limited. And what I mean by that is I do think what you'll see change is that you'll see a scale up our go-to-market strategy. So you're just going to see, you know, more salespeople, more marketing people. But, um, you know, we've intentionally somewhat built the company to be IPO ready. And so like a lot of how our comms are working already today and other things, you know, we don't really want to change a lot of that. Um, we do have to be careful about which voices speak. And so, you know, you've already seen that not everybody can speak as much um, just because we don't want to get too close to certain issues that would you know, about, would have concern. But I also think a lot of public companies take too much advice from their legal counsel and go too careful here. You know, the whole idea about being a public company is to go do your business. And our business is to, you know, bring real use cases, drive revenue from banks and governments and industries to use the Chia blockchain and, you know, at, and bring additional developers. We're going to keep talking about that. We're going to keep marketing for that. And we're going to keep doing what we do. All right. So it'll almost be like additional rocket fuel to go faster. That's exactly it. And it also really gives us some tools. You know, it's one of those things where like, if we feel like coin price isn't right, we can do things like sell stock and buy coins. And the reverse obviously is the ultimate goal in the sense of, you know, slowly but surely moving the pre-farm out to the public shareholder base. What does that look like? Um, if, if you're allowed to talk about that. Sure. I mean, what we what we've said in the past, and there's no real change to this, is there's kind of two major methods. One would be to dividend it, so you'd actually like receive chia, you know, one chia per ten shares or something like that. Um, or uh, what we probably will do because it's more tax efficient is that we will sell chia and buy stock back. So you know, you as a shareholder get the positive of the stock buybacks, but then you get more control over when you take your either short or long term capital gain. Okay. Very interesting. And this will be the first blockchain to ever do this, right? That's correct. I mean, you know, the only things that are related are the miners, Coinbase, and, you know, circles in the process as well right now. Wow. All right. Let's see. Where do you hope and envision the company in 10 years from now? In 10 years, you know, I hope we're one of the dominant blockchains. I expect we're going to have most all of the real world assets trading on the Geo blockchain. Uh, I'm hoping it's a scaled Red Hat enterprise software business with a big SaaS business around our kind of enterprise cloud wallet. Um, really being able to take equities and debt and moving cash and make that all kind of one market. I think that's going to be a tremendously powerful thing once people start to unlock that they really can do this and it's, you know, easy or easier even than what they currently do. You know, I, I think once back offices at financial institutions realize how much better their lives can be, that there's going to be a scramble to move just a ton of this stuff over because it is just so much easier, you know, settlement in five minutes versus, you know, right now equity still take two days. It's about to become one day and we live on the internet. What the hell? So, so, you know, I, I think what we, what we see there is, you know, a large and growing enterprise software business and a very vibrant developer infrastructure that's both us and others. You know, CNI is by no way going to be the dominant animal overall. I think what you're going to see, in fact, is much like Linux, you know, IBM before they bought Red Hat even had, you know, entire teams that were de helping develop the Linux kernel from inside IBM as well as inside Intel and inside others. You know, I think you're going to see that banks and governments are going to have teams that are, you know, Chilisp experts writing tools and adding to the core software because they've got some application that needs something now and, you know, they'd rather move it forward faster. Wow. Interesting. All right. Um, <clears throat> what are some ways that you would recommend to the Chia community that they could help support CNI move forward towards its goals? I, you know, I, I, so how do I put this? I don't think you need to worry about supporting us. It's more about continuing to build interesting things on Chia that bring folks eyeballs. I mean, you know, the, the, it's, how do I put it? The messaging that Chia is a superior blockchain from the actual users who had nothing to do with CNI is so much more valuable and believable than almost any marketing message that CNI can deliver. You know, one of the things we promise to do is to continue to kind of make our kind of messages easier to consume, more bite size, you know, steal my tweet threads, right? But my point is, is that the, the, the people who uh, have a much better reach are going to be the average folks who really believe it for the right reasons and can articulate it in their own words. Very good. I was just thinking of uh, Michael Taylor as you were talking about that. Exactly. So he's out there 
working on data layer, making uh, Chia's blockchain do something new and novel. That's right. All right. Check the time here. Okay, we're doing good. Um, so you've mentioned in the past, you've got a little personal farm going. You still got that farm going? Yeah, I actually, uh, I have two little baby farms, same farmer. Uh, one's running on our Raspberry Pi 4, and the other one's running on the old, I'm, uh, not even iMac, uh, Mac Mini uh, that I put Linux on. And it's just, you know, both, I've been earning more than I probably should. My luck is pretty strong. Uh, it's only like, I don't know, 20 terabytes. Like, we're not talking about a lot of space. Um, but, uh, I also like to make sure like I'm got it running over here to make sure like mains working correctly. And, you know, I test new releases before they go out. So, you know, just want to make sure that we stay very close to dog food and all this stuff. And I know like everything's working right. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I've seen, uh, on GitHub, you're, you're pushing some updates on stuff. When, when things annoy me, I will often just go fix them still. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So you have some coding knowledge too. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I wrote a lot of software in my first startup um, and then kind of lost that. But with the pandemic and everything else, it was kind of like, well, there's not a lot of business work I need to be doing. Might as well brush off my skills, learn Python and, you know, go. And um, I also, I just, you know, have a kind of DevOps system administrator background as well. So, you know, I did a lot of our kind of, you know, before Justin got here, CI and build infrastructure and, you know, with Amin now kind of backfilling that, it's great. But you know, that was definitely something where I knew I could just kind of get out of everybody else's software development way and get, get all these packages working and just make it all, you know, build and, and compile and get done. So, so that was very much what I did until we kind of launched, but then of course I had to kind of switch hats and go into hire a bunch of people mode and, you know, start really pushing on the real world use case side. Yeah. All right. But I keep my okay, jobs. Let's... Like I don't want to lose the, lose complete uh, track of what's going on. I guess uh, on that topic, it's been joked about, but it's true that Bram doesn't like computers. <laughs> it does not like computers. <laughs> so I assume that means he's also not one to want to code either. He's more of the high level math. Uh, uh, mixed. So a lot of his code is very theoretical. So he'll write code to figure out where like, you know, like 41.3% attack surface if you have 100 time lords, right? He'll go figure that out. Now, however, he has written quite a bit of code uh, for gaming. Um, so the referee coins and that sort of stuff, you can see quite a bit of code there. Though, again, what he ended up doing was kind of building a very detailed spec. And actually, um, Art, Art Yerkes has been doing a lot of the actual final implementation to get gaming kind of much closer to crossing the line. So, you know, I'll say it this way. There's almost no pieces of code other than the stuff I kind of do where it's up at the application layer and OS layer that otherwise wasn't specced out by Bram. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole... Uh, now, it's getting better in the sense that a lot of folks are able to just kind of take these, you know, projects and go, Oh, I need to add this feature to that vault. I'll just go do that. But, you know, even there, the, the, the methods and the patterns were originally laid out by Bram as far as how he wanted Chilisp to work. Right. And now having Bram done gaming, you know, you'll see like Chilisp 23 and 24 uh, varieties are getting much easier to use and much more feature rich because Bram was really sitting there coding going, I should be able to do this. Can we add this to the compiler? So, you know, I think ultimately the gaming project is going to have some really excellent dividends to just every developer who wants to do Chialisp. Wow. Was Bram part of that decision-making process in choosing Chialisp over alternatives? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, the, the way we really did that is we sat down and went, okay, you know, we all agree that Bitcoin is mostly right about all of its security assumptions. So what are the, you know, main items we want out of a you know turing complete smart contracting language and we listed them and then uh, richard on the team looked at us and went you know you just described a lisp right and of course like bram and i and others kind of look at each other and go oh but he's right and that was literally where chialis kind of came from it was us really looking at a first principles analysis on a whiteboard and going okay this is actually all the elements we really want out of a smart contracting programming language and so from there, you know, it was a first pass at what that should look like. Um, you know, interestingly, when uh, you hit reality, all of a sudden a bunch of other like nice to haves become, hey, we should support other signature methods and wait, you know, we could support pass keys natively. And so you've seen a little bit of evolution of GLisp, but not a lot. Um, you know, some of it's around announcements and we figured out where they're so far, the places where we've seen um, security mishandling, you know, 
developers writing things that kind of shoot them in the, in the foot. We've had some actually relatively straightforward ways to change Chilisp and the opcodes to make it so you can't do that. Uh, and, you know, that's very contrasted with Solidity where there are, you know, entire classes of problems that there's no real good solution for. You just have to hope that developers understand them and audit them well. You know, we didn't want Chilisp to be that way. And so far it's proven very clearly that it's not been that way. All right. Well, we have a whole bunch of community questions that have come in. So let's uh, start at the top of those. Let's see. How does one approach integrating financial institutions when their systems have been Band-Aid layers upon layers since the 70s and 80s? Yeah, usually what has to happen is that if you've got these better custody tools, you're literally just, you know, putting in a whole new application infrastructure. I mean, the, the fastest way for them is to, in fact, not use those existing tools primarily. It's usually to write new web applications, whatever web framework they're working with, that then treats our APIs and infrastructure as the kind of core account capabilities. And that's very much what we were building with the enterprise wallet is the ability for them to have a kind of SaaS centralized infrastructure that they can just, you know, call an RPC to do what they need to do instead of trying to build an actual blockchain application. All right. Next question is, how do you see gaming on the blockchain and tokenization of game assets integrating with Chia in the future? Well, there's a couple different answers to the word gaming, right? There's certainly kind of um, already what you see with uh, uh, card gaming and kind of, you know, asset tokenization gaming. And we've got that, uh, you know, already happening. There's a different kind of gaming, which is kind of peer-to-peer -peer money gaming, which is what Bram's working on um, in the background. And so, you know, I think you're going to see pretty soon uh, the peer-to-peer -peer gaming stuff take off. I think it's a pretty compelling use case. It's going to be one of the best implementations ever. You know, it really uh, is only dual because of the power of Chia Lisp and the Chia blockchain. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, and I just think part of this is, is that the game industry has still a lot of the overhang of Bitcoin energy use bad, Sam Bankman freed bad. It's going to take the gaming world a little more time to get comfortable with blockchains. And I think what you're going to see is that, you know, financial use cases are going to lead. And once those start to continue to happen more and things like luxury goods will start to make the brand problem go away. And I think once the brand problem goes away, real game designers do understand why these things are valuable. And then they start making a real technology analysis. Now, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that the Chia blockchain layer one is expected to be an expensive layer one. You know, we kind of have an idea that a $10 per transaction cost is what you expect. And, you know, it could easily go as high as 20. You know, if you're if you're running an equity security, that's so cheap that compared to what you used to do that it's not funny. But if you're game, you know, $10 to like trade a Pokemon card is not acceptable. So there may be other blockchains that make more sense for some of those sorts of things. But that's why, like, when we talk about peer-to-peer -peer gaming, it won't matter. You know, it might be that, yeah, it costs 10 bucks to get your gaming channel going. But once you're in, you're in, and it won't cost 10 bucks necessarily to lock new, new value in because you don't necessarily have to do an on-chain uh, lock-in to add new payments to a payment channel. That's, that's, those are some of the things I'm alluding to about there are better ways to do payment channels than the current way they work on Bitcoin. So you know, ultimately, layer twos and other chains are probably where a lot of this is going to happen just because those gaming transactions aren't necessarily worth the security that they otherwise get down on layer one, right? I mean, you know, it's don't, don't pay for something you don't need. Makes sense. Yeah, and the next uh, question was on the same lines. Gaming state channel in 2024? Question mark. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it'll be in production production, but you'll be able to play with it and there'll be beta at least in this calendar year, I'm pretty sure. All right. Uh, next question. What can you do with offer files other than trading tokens, cats, NFTs? So a great example of what you can do with an offer file is you can have a data layer proposed transaction. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, the government of Japan could propose to the government of Bhutan that if the government of Japan made this change in their voluntary carbon registry and for that change in Bhutan's, then here's 30 million USDC. And they can email that offer file over to Bhutan and Bhutan can look at it and go, yeah, that's what we agreed to. And then atomically update both data layer tables and settle the USDC on chain in real time. So basically any web to traditional infrastructure that you can expose on data layer can be part of a sophisticated composable transaction. And one of the things I think is people think about offer files very one-to-one. -one. What offer files really can do, and we're starting to see this a bit with Dexy and TibetSwap, 
you know, if I want to buy a hundred thousand dollars worth of something and they want a hundred thousand worth USDC, but I've only got PYUSD and USDT, I can actually go out and compose a transaction that basically swaps my PYUSD and my USDT into USDC at the same time it takes the transaction I'm trying to buy. And, you know, you're seeing Dexy like pull liquidity potentially off to bet swap to complete a transaction that otherwise doesn't have enough, say, Chia available to buy. You know, it, it's that composability that's what's so powerful about offers. And, you know, we've just kind of scratched the surface of what offers can do. You know, offers absolutely can do things like, hey, I'm willing to buy 100 XCH at plus or minus this Oracle by 3%. So I don't say exactly what the price is, but I'm saying, hey, in this range, I'm willing to trade. And, you know, those things are totally doable in the offer file, Chia list under, underneath, but just aren't yet part of the user experience, experience and interface, right? And, and again, this is what is exciting for me is that there's all these kinds of things that once we start to put UI to them and user experience to them, I think it gets even more clear why offers are such a killer app. You know, one of the things I said in Dubai the other day was that, you know, everybody thinks they want tokenization. What they really need is offers. Very good. All right. Um, another question is how long until Linux has a feature where you can farm in the background, creating and deleting plots as space is used? Look, I think that's one of those great things community could do. It's not that hard from where we're at. And, you know, we already are kind of publishing and building the, you know, Debian Red Hat uh, packages. You know, it's imminently doable. And long term, we think, in fact, a lot of the operating systems will just do this in the background where they'll basically show you what you think is uh, unused space, but is actually farming in the background. Um, one of the things that we might be able to do actually is to decrease the K size minimum. Um, it turns out that the way the plot filter stuff all works, we might actually be able to start with slightly smaller. And that gets really interesting because it makes it that much more granular. You know, that was the rig trade off with K32 is, you know, I would have loved to use K31, but it was pretty clear to me that the memory bus speeds were going to be such that you could start getting to scary places with K31 much faster than K32. But if we can step that down a little bit, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you don't have a lot of unused hard drive space. It's not either farming or being used by stuff you care about. That's great. Yeah, I had seen uh, Dr. Nick comment on that the other day on Discord. How uh, Hopefully in the future plot format, they'll be able to work in smaller plot sizes, more conducive to laptops and stuff like that. Yeah. That's great. All right. Notwithstanding the difference in use cases, how does CNI compete with Ripple, who are also looking to IPO? Notwithstanding the fact that we're a completely different thing. Uh, well, <laughs> thing number one is we're actually decentralized. Uh, so Ripple really isn't. Um, Ripple basically has a bunch of assumed validators, which are either run by Ripple or Ripple like pays for them running them independently. So, you know, it's not a decentralized network. And I think they try to claim they have smart contracts, but I don't believe it. Um, you know, the reality is, is that smart capabilities are inherent in the Chia blockchain. Like the literally XCH is itself a smart coin. And so it's just a very different paradigm. And it is, you know, something ready today to do smart contract capability stuff. Like, I don't know how you would do advanced vault custody on Ripple, period. So you're now back to custody problems. You know, you're, you're back in that world of this stuff as a toy that's not ready for prime time. Right. Do you think offers would ever be used for trading things like mortgage backed securities? Yes. <laughs> In fact, it's those, you know, how would I put it right now? If you're, you know, a Microsoft shareholder, or you're Microsoft. Microsoft has good market depth and liquidity. The only negatives are the market's closed a lot. And, you know, honestly, it's somewhat hard if you're not in the United States or certain other countries to actually hold Microsoft stock. So, you know, that one's sort of well fixed, but like a mortgage backed security or certain like, you know, bespoke uh, hedge fund type assets, there's no real good first world place to trade that. And so the one market on the Chia blockchain is a really compelling way to get 24 seven trading, to get access to liquidity globally. You know, and it's one of the important things, it's like a big difference between the account based uh, blockchains and the Chia blockchain. TVL is a bad thing the Chia blockchain. Like you don't want to lock value. You want value to be in flow and they're able to be used as liquidity to buy something or sell something. And that's the neat thing about offers is it never really locks the liquidity. Like, you know, the interface shows you it locked so it's not confusing to you. Now we're going to stop doing that because we need it to be, you know, exposed to the user in a way that better explains to them that there are pending 
potential claims, but they could still make another offer yet on this other asset. But the idea is, is that all of a sudden, you know, you can, as an asset issuer, post your offer for one item in XCH, WUSDT, WSDC, MilliETH, you know, do all of them, right? And have all of them time out in 30 minutes. And like, if one gets taken, it automatically cancels all the others. You know, it, it really is a step change from what a market could have. Because, you know, right now, there's not a lot of people who would write a put or a call option on mortgage-backed security. Well, we're going to ship in the wallet the ability for people to write covered calls and covered puts on those kinds of assets. So, you know, a new asset issuer immediately picks up all the features and functionality of a first-class marketplace. All right. Now, perhaps the most important question comes from Chloe. Have you ever had a pet budgie? <laughs> I have not had a pet budgie. I have had friends who've had pet budgies, though arguably I have pet budgies on Discord. <laughs> Many of us there. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Gene. It was great to get to chat with you and, and hear your uh, high level views of all this stuff it's uh, you know so much it's kind of like mind-blowing that you can go from business to law to technology and juggle all of it at once so i'm impressed and i didn't have to uh get a rescue at but <laughs> thank you so much for joining us and i uh, look forward to seeing you on discord some more thanks brian and see you guys see you guys in the community all right take care thanks, thanks.